This is the original bell that they used here at the school. The teacher would come to the door like this and ring the bell. All the kids would come running in from everywhere because I know they used to play all over the place. Yeah, my name is Don Whitney. Um, my family lived up the road uh, starting in 18, about 1800, so all of my ancestors went to this school. This is, of course, called the Spencer Hollow School because we're in Spencer Hollow now. And the, uh, the only written record that we've been able to find of, as to when this school was built was in the, book, in the book that was called the Folklore Springfield, published in 1922, that says this school was built in 1781. So we're, we're still going by that because nobody has found, <coughs> come up with a different date. And so from 1781 until 1926, this was a primary school for District 6. This is, this is called District 6. And all the kids in this area, in Spencer Hollow, went to school here f uh, first grade through the eighth. And then the, when they graduated from here, they went into Springfield for high school. Uh, I just missed going to school here because I started school in 1929, and it, by that time they were busing us into Springfield, and, uh, go, and I went to the East School that's on Summer Street. Uh, we've been working on uh, restoring the school since uh, about... 2007, the summer of 2007, uh, some of us got together and decided that we'd like to see the, the school restored and uh, so that this building would be preserved. It's probably, as far as I know, one of the oldest uh, municipal buildings here in Springfield. There are some homes, private homes, that are some, somewhat older than this. And as you can see, this was a brick building and we feel, <coughs> we're pretty sure that the bricks were made just down the road because on Keith Ferguson's land on his farm just down the road about three quarters of a mile, when he uh, plows up one of his, some of his, one of his fields, they keep uh, <coughs> bringing up pieces of brick. And I guess they've discovered that there were a couple of brick hills there. And so, when they built buildings back in the, in the 18th century, they usually didn't have the bricks trucked in from any distance. They, they found where they, there would be a local, core, uh, <coughs> a local clay banks where they could make bricks and have a, a, a brick kill to fire the bricks. These bricks are softer than the ones that are made today, but otherwise they're a lot the same. They, uh, We've had to restore uh, the windows because this school, uh, you know, to get back a little more history, the school closed in 1926. And in about 1931, or actually in October 1931, a lot of the neighbors, because this was all farms around here, they got together and formed what they called the Spencer Hollow Club. And then they asked the town, because this school building was sitting here empty for the last five years, they asked the town if they could use this school for <coughs> this building for a social club. So they got the approval and uh, they hired people, a carpenter, to do a little work inside of this, uh, this addition, this kitchen, what we call it, kitchen wing, which was added sometime after the original building but we're not able to determine just when. So the club took over, and one of the things they did, they ran round and square dances about every two weeks. They'd, be, uh, they'd have a round, probably two round dances and then a square. And they had, in, well, we'll go inside later, they had some musicians. Uh, I know that they had a piano player. We still have the piano in here and a violinist, and sometimes a, a banjo, and sometimes a horn. Uh, 
when all this was going on, I was about nine years old, and I used to live just up the road about three quarters of a mile. So I'd come down on my bike and see what was going on. And also, the, us kids around the neighborhood <coughs> would go to the dances. Uh, we could stay there for maybe till nine or 10, and uh, they'd uh, <coughs> run a square dance like the Virginia Reel that all, you know, all kids like to do. So I had a pretty good idea of how the club was run. And then it was used for the people that <coughs> were having a wedding anniversary. I guess there was even one wedding that took place here back in the 30s. And uh, a lot of uh, events like that were held in this building. And then later, starting in, uh, well, probably in the 30s, uh, the 4-H club used this for their uh, meeting, their meeting place. And uh, they fixed it up some and put curtains on the windows, which are gone now. and things like that, and these two gentlemen over here were in the 4-H at that time, so they know much more about it than I do. After the 40s and uh, 50s, the 4-H club did use this building, and they, they kept it in good shape. Uh, then about probably in the 1970s, uh, the club, the 4-H club stopped meeting here, and uh, so the building was left empty. And the windows, the shutters had been taken off some time before. These are the original shutters, and we finally found them stored in the attic. So anyway, vandals broke most all of the windows. They not only broke the windows, but they broke what these are called the muntin strips that separate the glass panes. Those were broken, and so the school, the building was practically open, you know. They, Wind, rain, snow, and everything could blow through the windows. And I guess for a time, the door was even, the main front door was left open or unlocked. And so somebody came in probably in the 80s or, or 90s and stole the original, what they call the jacketed stove that was in the school building, in the schoolroom. And so the <coughs> building was left like that for, for uh, quite, a, well, all the years from probably uh, 1970 through uh, three years ago, through to two, uh, 2007. And I know we would talk about it some that people would say, well, we should uh, preserve this building, restore it and fix it up. And finally, I came out one day and took a lot of pictures, took some pictures through the window and uh, we got permission from the town of Springfield, from the select board, to go ahead and restore, preserve the building, which we've been doing for the last three years. And uh, right now we have a pretty good sized crew, and, and we have Doug Moulton, and, who is a professional carpenter, that's helped us in a lot of the, <laughs> doing a lot of this work that we couldn't do. And the big thing about having the shutters, see, when we leave the building empty, we shut the shutters and that would prevent uh, vandals from re-breaking the windows because we didn't really dare put the windows back in until we had some protection. Let's go inside and see what's going on in there. We've uh, just finished uh, restoring most of the ceiling and I can show you what happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's Alan Woodbury scraping and Bill Mitchell scraping. I believe that's the same piano that they had here when they were running the dances. And I can remember the piano, <coughs> the original stove was about where that stove is now. And the piano was right in front of where that window is. And I can remember they had a man, a musician from Springfield who played in local dances. He played the piano, and there was another man from Springfield that played the violin, and sometimes a banjo. Sometimes they'd have a banjo, and I guess sometimes a saxophonist. And 
You can imagine what it looked like when they were doing square dances here. They would have about four, four sets, and the man that called the square dances would start. It would stand beside the stove, and he'd have a stove poker, and he'd rap on the stove, and he'd tell everybody what the next dance was going to be and how to do it. Is it going to be a plain quadrill, and you balance the swing, and you know all the instructions. For square dances, and they had great times. Uh, I think it was 50 cents for 50 cents a couple, uh, 35 cents for a single, and I think a lot of romances started here in this school, in this building, at one time or another. And the reason that we're working on the ceiling, the roof uh, was. When we checked it out three years ago, there were three, three leaks in the roof where slates were missing. And one right in that area and one in that area. And you can see we've replaced these ceiling boards. And uh, but because the roof leaked, it, it started chipping off from the paint. So now we're going to yeah, scrape. Yeah, probably had yeah, several yeah, coats. White paint. Yeah. Do you think the original was a varnish? Yeah, I figured it out It could be because you know this this was a chestnut, you know, these original boards were chestnut and that has a you know a beautiful grain. Yeah. And it would yeah. be it would be uh, and then uh, under under the first or over the varnish is this uh, so called paint with the limeish color where oh. you got this. Oh color, yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't want to bring this down to the varnish again, do you? No, okay. We're not going to varnish it. No, we'll just <laughs> we'll just scrape in the loose paint and then yeah. sand it to kind of blend it in, yeah. and then prime it, and uh, and then paint. And I'm trying to th think what color. We we'll probably try to match the color that's on there now, yeah. close as possible. The, the ceiling structure is pretty good because when we had these boards off, we could see that the stringers or the ceiling uh, joists go that way. They have to be 24 feet long to go all the way across the room, but they're good rugged beams, four by six, 20 inches on center, which is kind of unusual. Then these boards are nailed to uh, strapping that goes in that direction. So the, uh, the roof structure or the ceiling structure is in, in good shape. Yeah. yeah, this picture is what we took yeah. in back in 2007 uh, shows what the windows were like the door was actually on the hinges but it, it was open and uh, there was a lot of brush around this building that was one of the first things we did was to cut the brush so that the building would uh, dry out better and there's a lot of the brush <coughs> stacked there the next picture shows what the ceiling what, a shot of the inside of the school, I guess taken through the window, and you can see the edge of the piano, and you can see that the damage uh, on the ceiling where these boards, because of the, of the water dripping down through, the boards warped and they had to be taken down, taken off. Now this is a picture that was taken, well we say circa 1910, taken of the inside of the building. Uh, inside of the school room, the desk, and then the teacher's desk, and on that desk is a bell, and I wish I'd thought I've got that bell in, in the car, because for some reason or other, 1926 when the school closed, my family inherited the old school bell. So you can just imagine the school teacher standing out in the door here, ringing the bell for the kids to come running in from all around here because 
They, they, had, they didn't just use the schoolyard, they played all over the place. Now this is a picture taken in 19, uh, about 1920 of the students. And uh, there's 20 students there. Uh, that's one of my sister, one of my older sisters, and another older sister, and that's my brother. Uh, this is Richard Whitcomb, uh, and we've got the names of all of the uh, other students here. So that shows the size of the class that was operating. Oh yes, thank you. Here's another picture taken a little bit later, in, in 22. Uh, that's my sister, and uh, this is Richard Whitcomb. I guess a lot of people in Springfield remember him. Uh, this is uh, Austin Goings, who is Carl, Carl and Ralph Goings' father. That was Florence Whitcomb. That, she is, uh, was uh, Richard's sister. And that was uh, Frank Rummel, who lived in the area and plus some of the others. I took this picture to show what the window looked like. Uh, see, we had, we boarded the windows up uh, back three years ago so that it wouldn't be any more vandalism. But you can see that on this particular window, which I think was that one, all the Munson strips had been broken out on that sash and most of them up here. And uh, so that, now they're restored. This was the door, the front door, before restoration because we had to replace the bottom sill. We had to uh, replace uh, the moldings around this panel. We were able to save the panel. So that's some of the work that we've done already. And uh, we're, we've got a good crew here now. We're getting a lot of things done. This, what I call the kitchen wing or the addition, uh, we're not sure when it was built. We can tell from the type of framing up overhead that it was probably way back in the 1800s, but after the main building was built. Because the main building, uh, you can see from outside, there was a door here. You can see where it's been bricked in. And uh, we just discovered recently that the door was there but there was a partition across here that gave them a hallway about three or four feet wide. So evidently they came in that door into the hall and the outhouse would have been a separate, little separate building outside. Sometime when they put this addition on, then they had some more space out here and also later we'll see that they had a three-holer uh, what we call outhouse <laughs> and back. When I was a kid, about nine years old, I, I said I used to come down on my bike to see what was going on, the changes that the Spencer Hollow Club made. And one of, the, one of the changes was to make this, cut this hole through to the kitchen and uh, so they could serve food through here. And originally there was a shelf that would hinge down and uh, so give them a space here. And when they had the uh, round and square dances, most of the women that came to the dance would bring a little box of some nice cookies or, or sandwiches. And uh, at, a, at 11 o'clock, everything would shut down. They'd stop dancing. And they, by then, they'd made a big urn of coffee. And the women would go out there and serve sandwiches and, and goodies and a coffee. And everybody would sit around and, and have their sandwiches. And then about 11.30, they, the band would start up again and they'd have three or four more dances. But usually they closed at midnight because most all of the people that came here were farmers. And they had to get up <coughs> five o'clock or earlier the next morning to uh, milk the cows and do all the chores. So midnight was kind of late. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've, I've heard some guys that said, well, they went to a dance and they got in at 4 o'clock and at 5 o'clock they had to start milking the cows. <laughs> oh. 
this stove, we don't really know <laughs> where it came from, but sometime when the, the 4-H club was using this, somebody donated this stove, and it's a real nice one because it was a combination wood and gas. Uh, I'm sure that we could, <laughs> with a little cleaning up, we could use the wood part of it. The gas part would have to be checked out and everything. But, and then they, of course, had the chimney here. So they could actually cook things and... Uh, I'd like to find out sometime who donated the stove. It's quite roomy. Yes, and I, when the uh, Spencer Hollow Club took over, they did some renovating, and I'm sure they, the ones that put in the new ceiling and uh, the sidewalls with <coughs> panel boards. And we did have electricity. But, uh, See, in about 1930, uh, this whole area was electrified. Before that, we didn't have any. We didn't have electricity. So uh, this building, when, when this, the club took over, they had electric <coughs> entrance, and there was a transformer down on the pole down there. And it came in here. There was a, a fuse box and everything. But we've taken all of the old electrical uh, <coughs> wires and everything out because we know if we're going to re-electrify sometime all of this would have to be replaced with a modern up-to-date uh, uh, electrical plant equipment. Here to the right is what we call a three-holer. It was a, um, sometimes called a dry toilet and we can get a better look at it. We'll go outside and, and look in the door. The reason uh, Spencer Hollow is called Spencer Hollow because it, it was settled by three Spencer men that, that uh, bought the land in Spencer Hollow and had farms. I guess they had three farms, and one was uh, owned by Jeremiah Spencer, and that's where the school is now. The land where the school is, it was on his property. We, are, we weren't able to find anywhere in the deed that, that he deeded the land uh, for the school. But later on, he sold that property to uh, a John Chase, who uh, later on the Chases did deed the land that the school was on and the school to the town of Springfield. My great-grandfather, Cyrus Whitney, bought the land that you see when you go up the, the Greeley Road and they uh, established the farm there which had been established just about 1800. So all of my ancestors from then on went to this school like my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, my father and aunts and uncles. And so the first house on the on the left on the Greeley Road was our house and across the road there were some big barns but those, those have been taken down. So my father sold that, uh, that farm in around 1968. So that's the first house on the Greeley Road. That's where I was brought up. <laughs> that's where the original door was and then it went into uh, kind of a, a narrow hallway and, uh, so, and then this, uh, this wooden addition was added sometime later, but originally that was a door and to get into the school and uh, somewhere outside here they had a, uh, an outhouse, <laughs> had another three-holer problem. This is a group of volunteers, great guys that have worked on restoring this school and uh, we have a lot of expertise here because we have professional carpenters and uh, people that know how to do all kinds of other things like scraping and painting <laughs> and so on. So I guess they'll uh, introduce themselves. Hey, I'm Alan Woodbury. Um, I became involved with this project uh, through Don. Uh, he got talking about it one time when I was at a meeting with him and it sounded like an interesting project and so I uh, hopped in, been here <laughs> A few weekends with him, but 
I missed a few too, Don, so yeah. <laughs> but enjoy it. He used to sell flowers. Remember him? <laughs> I'm Bill Mitchell. I live in the Spencer House just down the road, two tenths of a mile. I uh, got interested in the project when Don gave me a call and uh, see if I would be interested in helping out, which I joined him uh, jubilantly. And uh, we've been partners ever since and got quite a good group of people uh, supporting us all the way around our working crew here into the volunteer organization that's contributing money and things like that. Yeah, it's a great group of people. I'm Joe Trombley. Um, my connection is, is uh, we had a dairy farm right next door, just about mm -hmm. 300 yards down the road on the, on the other side. And I lived there for quite a number of years and ran a dairy farm with my folks. And uh, we used to maintain the ledger book that they had that when they rented this place out to different organizations around town. We had it there for years, the key. And, and we had 4-H here, what's 4-H here at this building, and, and uh, a lot of different other things. In fact, is we used to have people who'd read it for weddings. My sister was had her wedding reception here, and, and uh, back in the 60s, I guess it was, yep, somewhere right around there. So. <laughs> I'm West Silver Drew, and I live up the road a ways, and uh, I went through the 4-H here, and uh, uh, my brother was uh, at his wedding anniversary here, reception, and uh, mm -hmm. see Don down the store one day and he's telling me about it. And so I told him I was here anytime he wanted me. I'm glad to help. Except I can't get him in the winter because he fades to Arizona, <laughs> <laughs> Phoenix for the winters. Yeah. Like Ted Shivers, where does he go? Chile? Chile, yeah. I'm Doug Malton. I grew up in the neighborhood and went 4-H, a lot of uh, community parties and so forth here, so I had quite an interest in when Don put set this up. I'm more than willing to help. Mm. Yeah, I We're going to have a party a pretty that, quick. Uh, Don was the one that <laughs> I got hooked up through it, too, because I read in the paper that he was trying to get information on the school and so I give him a call. I happened to be out of work at that point in time. I was, had been laid up for a while so worked out good. I helped him a little bit when he got first organized. And now I'm retired so I get back into it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he helped me a lot because we first thing we did was cut all the brush around here and it was quite a mess. Also a big mess inside. <laughs> so Joe was the first guy that volunteered. Susie's been a big help down too. You know? Right, yeah, I should mention that, uh, uh, not John, but Tom, Tom. Tom Susie. And uh, sometimes it takes me a while to, to dig out names out of this old head. But yeah, he, uh, he has a little sawmill down the road about a mile or two, and, and uh, he volunteered to furnish uh, any of the timber, lumber that we need. And he has a lot of dry. He's got a lot of dry uh, two by fours and and dry pine, and we've used his uh, t his lumber. The wood that we used for replacing the ceiling came from him, and uh, we we had to put on a new fascia board around the back on back side of this building. He furnished the, the uh, boards for it, and so that's been a big help. Saved us a lot of money, and we don't have to go out and buy. Uh, boards and timber. Since we're recognizing some uh, important contributions, uh, I'd like to uh, mention Mark Bushway put five right. yard of gravel or sand, rather loam type stuff. Topsoil. <laughs> well, it was topsoil <laughs> and allowed us to fill in some holes, grade the backyard. Uh, and we're hoping that Ted Shivers uh, in the project in North Springfield for the Children and Families Organization, we may be able through Ted uh, to get another five to ten yards to do the entire backside. So we're a little bit waiting on that and uh, we've pulled out all the old electrics so we're ready to start looking at Central Vermont for power. Uh, we used to have power and it disappeared. A uh, little probably a rabid coon got it, you suppose. <laughs> and, uh, 
<laughs> of course, Lou Baldwin's is now back in the electrical business with HB, and he's part of our organization of support people. So we'll be talking with him a little bit about electrics later on. Meanwhile, we'll just do the, the work that's necessary to get it ready for painting, get the sub structure firm and secure, and go on, keep, just keep plugging along at it. It takes money to do what we're doing, and right now we're making out an application for a grant to finish up uh, stabilizing the roof. It, it needs a, a new, some new slates and some new roof boards, and uh, so we can get a matching grant to do that, but we have to have the money to match. So that we're very open to anybody that would like to contribute to the preservation of the school. They can do so very easily by making their check to the town of Springfield, but down in the memo on the uh, check, uh, <coughs> right in there for the preservation of the, spring, of the Spencer Hollow School. Yeah. And uh, they'll put it into uh, Jeff Mobus, the treasurer, who puts that money into a, mm -hmm. a separate account, and so we keep track of it, and of course we'll use it for uh, matching matching funds and when we get into doing brickwork it's going to be much more expensive this building needs a lot of probably thirty or forty thousand dollars worth of brickwork mm -hmm. so we'll need more donations mm -hmm. and hopefully we can get some grants that uh, won't have to be matching now the other thing i should mention that right now we're having it's being done by a professional they're writing up the application to make this and uh, put this on the historical national historical. Uh, list of historic places. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, this person started on it last spring, so I expect to be, we expect to be hearing from her maybe uh, before very long as to whether she's got this uh, all together. It, because it's to, to apply for this uh, national historic place it's very demanding because there's 60 pages of instructions just how to do it. And when, I, when we looked at that, we said, and we were advised that it, you better get professional help to have it done, to do it, to make sure it's right. And uh, we know that if we do get that designation, and we're pretty sure we should be able to, that there'll be more money available. I think it'll be the first place in Springfield with the uh, National Historic designation. We'd also got, uh, want to thank Dick Moore for the wood stove that we have in here, and we've asked Kim Porter to do some of the brickwork, uh, make the chimney safe and align it. Mm -hmm. So we're looking on a quotation from Kim. All kinds of people in the, involved. Now there are two more people that I want to be sure, and I don't know whether I had mentioned this before. Yeah. Uh, see, the roof uh, leaked, and they've made temporary uh, fixes on the roof, so it doesn't leak now. And the first uh, work was done by Ted Shivers in uh, mm -hmm. All Seasons Construction. He had a couple of men come out and uh, put the metal plating up and under some of the, <coughs> the slates that were missing. And then the... Uh, metal ridge strip along the top of the ridge here that was also missing so Don Gurney sent a, some of his men out last fall and replaced the ridge cap and so now we don't have to, the roof doesn't leak so we're able to finish uh, painting and uh, finish the ceiling and paint and, and do all that without having to worry about water damage mm. well good luck with your efforts Springfield really is proud of their heritage, mm. and they should be, you should find that they really do support your historic mm. efforts. Mm -hmm. Well, I felt when I first came out and looked at this school, of course I knew about it forever, I said if we don't do something now, in another 10, 15, or 20 years, the building is going to start falling down. And everybody, everybody will say then, oh gee, we should have done something, we should have <laughs> preserved it. Yep. But by then it would be too late. <laughs> One person we neg neglected to mention when you were <coughs> filming us, uh, a man by the name of D Doug George who lives right across 
from the school up that little driveway. Uh, his house is, would, you could see his house if the trees weren't there. But anyway, about five or six years ago, he realized that the door of the school was left open and that allowed vandals to come in and it allowed somebody to steal the original stove. So he had the forethought to uh, nail some board, a couple of boards across the door so it kept vandals out. And then later when we did start working on the school and restoring it, uh, there were three big old rotten stumps in the schoolyard and he came down with his tractor and backhoe and took those stumps out and then also quite a few smaller stumps from some of the brush that grew there. And that was a big help to our uh, project. I would like to also uh, let folks know that anyone who has an uh, ancestor that attended school or knows of people who did or knows of any of the teaching staff that used to be here, we'd like to hear from you. You can call Don or myself, 885-5068 uh, for me. And Don, what's your number? 886-2863. So you have contact. I'll give you and, uh, our card. It's our hope that we can learn some of the ancestries and where they went from the time they were here. I already have quite a lot of history, as much as we've been able to find about the teachers that taught here. We have a list of the students that were, went here in 1823. I have the name of a man that taught here sometime before 1821. And we have a listing that was made by Hugh Kendall's great-grandmother who taught here in about 1878 and 80. And we have a copy of her ledger book where she kept records of all the students. <laughs> And she had beautiful handwriting. <laughs> People knew how to write yeah. then. Now they can't even do it with a computer. <laughs> yeah.